Nehemiah and God's people pressed through the opposition of their enemies. But their enemies did not give up easily. Sanballat and Tobiah did everything within their power to discourage, distract, and discredit Nehemiah. But Nehemiah refused to allow his enemies to talk him out of the work God had given him. This week, how to remain focused and finish strong in the midst of distractions. And this is the last in a series that we've been doing, which is called Change Your World in 52 days. And it all comes from the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, if you guys remember, for those who haven't been here, Nehemiah, he was a cupbearer to the king uh, Artaxerxes. I think I said that right. No, uh, anyway, this Artie dude, Artie, King Artie. <laughs> yeah, that's Artaxerxes. Xer Xerxes. Artaxerxes. Okay, anyway. A guy whose name should be a whole lot simpler to uh, re-pronounce, whatever. But anyway, he's the king of Persia. And uh, at the time, uh, Nehemiah was a cupbearer for him. And Nehemiah had his brother come back from Jerusalem, come back where, where all the uh, Israelites got to go back from their captivity. They got to go back to Judah, and they got to go back to Jerusalem, and they'd been there for a long time. And so when he came back, he talked to Nehemiah, and Nehemiah goes, how's it going? What's going on over there? And he says, brother, it is bad. It is really bad. He says, the walls are down. The people are uh, vulnerable to attacks all the time, and there's shame for God. You know, that was God's uh, temple there, and, and there's this embarrassment. And so what happened, God put a burden on Nehemiah, and Nehemiah just sat down and he cried. And then he prayed to God. And then he got up and he met, went to action and he went to the king and God had given him a plan. I want you to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Simple, very simple. He wasn't a builder. He wasn't a contractor. He was a cupbearer. And the one who drank the wine before the king to make sure that it wasn't poison. And so he did. He goes over there, and as he's going over there, uh, he gets, gathers all the people around, and they start working on the wall. In the meantime, they had all kinds of opposition. They had all kinds of people try to stop them because they did not want Jerusalem to uh, be a nation again. They did not want Jerusalem to be a city again. They'd love to impose their will upon them, their taxes upon them, take advantage of the people. But God says, I, enough's enough. I'm going to put my, a burden in Nehemiah's heart. And so Nehemiah went out, and he says, oh, I'm going to rebuild the wall. And this all happened a long time ago. 440 years before Jesus Christ was even born. And the walls, they had been down for 140 years. 140 years, the walls around this great city had been down. Now here comes a man, and he's going to do something great for God. We're going to pick up in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1. If you have your Bibles, and it'll be up on the screen as well, but I encourage you to look at your Bibles and make sure it's correct. Amen? It says this. When the word came to Sambalat, now, and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arab. First of all, I want you guys to know, these, are these good people or are these bad people? These are the bad guys. These are the bad guys. It says, when the word, when word came to Sambalat, Tobiah, and Gesh, uh, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of the enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates. So what happened? Within less than 52 days, he's already got the walls totally built. And we're not just talking a wall about yay high, folks. We're not talking about a wall yay thick. We're talking about a very wide, thick wall, very high wall. And the whole purpose of the wall at that time was to keep out enemies, to keep out raiders, to keep, keep the people in the city safe. So now he's built a wall out of all the rubble, all the stones. They've got this wall all built up. The only thing they haven't got now are the gates to the city put in. The great, big, wooden, heavy gates that they can open and close. And I want you to notice, when they're working on the wall, we have the three enemies here, Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem. They don't want this to be finished. And now it's at the very last moment, and they realize, we gotta do something. We tried our best to stop them a long time ago. We put up obstacles, we put up roadblocks, we did everything to discourage them. We got to do something now. So now they're very, they're, they're in a, a turmoil, panic, trying their best to stop them from doing it. And so now they're sending out things. But I want you guys to notice something. When God calls you to do something, the closer that you get to what God wants to have done, the harder the enemy will try to stop you. Take this to heart. This is for you and I. This happened for Nehemiah, but this is for us as well. The closer that you get to accomplishing what God has called you to do, the harder the enemy is going to fight you and stop you from accomplishing God's will in your life and the life around you. So, who's ever encountered that in your own life? 
You're doing something for Jesus. You're doing something for the church. You're doing something that you want to draw closer to God. And all of a sudden, you're working at it. And all of a sudden, it comes to it. And all of a sudden, just pound, pound. Everything comes against you. And it makes it very difficult to do. Remember, we don't face opposition for doing something bad. We only face opposition for doing something good. And that's our spiritual enemy. When he sees us drawing closer to God, he will fight you tooth and nail. Some of you have tried, uh, started, you know what? This is the year that we are going to draw closer to God. Every January, how many of you guys have ever had uh, what, what they call it, New Year's resolutions? You guys have some good spiritual New Year's resolutions. This is the year that I'm going to be in the Bible. This is the year I'm going to be in prayer every single day. And I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to make it happen. But you always encounter something, it seems like, don't you? How about on the way to church? Maybe you said, you know what, my family and I, we're going we're gonna to go to church. We're going to be at church every single Sunday. We're going to be on time. And you get in that car and you come here, and about the time you pull in the parking lot, the, one of the kids throw up all over each other, right? You guys ever have something like that happen? Just, just no, I better not tell that story. Never mind. <laughs> but something like that happens. It's like, why does that happen? Or maybe you're going to have a, this is the year that we're going to have a spiritual marriage. I, as, as a husband, I'm going to be the priest I'm going to encourage my wife. I'm going to help her to be her very best. And we as a uh, husband and wife, we're going to raise our children to love the Lord. And on the, way to work, on the way to church, what happens? Someone is late getting around. Someone's late getting in the car. And on the way here, you're yelling and arguing at each other. When you get to church, you can't do anything. You just, I can't receive from God. I can't even give to God. I'm so frustrated. How many of you guys ever had that happen to you? Okay, yeah. Look at all these people not telling the truth. Anyway. <laughs> or maybe, how about this one? My body is the body of God. It's a temple of God. This year, you know, I'm going to give up this habit of smoking that I, I just feel convicted by or whatever habit it may be in your life. I'm going to give it up. I'm going to stop it. And you've done it for six months. And then all of a sudden, you go and visit a friend or whatever it may be or some stressful thing comes into your life and you, you don't go to God immediately. And all, what do you do? Sometimes you go right back to that pack of cigarettes and you're right back into that habit again even though you said, this is the year it's gonna be different. This is the year I'm gonna be set free. Every single time you try and do something for God, the devil will come against you. He doesn't come against you for doing something wrong. He comes against you for doing something good. And the closer that you come to accomplishing what God has called for you, the harder that enemy will fight in your life to stop you from doing what God has called you to do. Hallelujah. Today, we'll look at two strategies. I want to give you two strategies that the spiritual enemy uses to take you off the wall that you're supposed to be building for God, take you off that thing that God has called you to do, that burden. I want to give you two strategies, strategies that the enemy gives you to stop you in your tracks. Okay, ready? Strategy number one, your enemy will try to distract you, distract you. How many of you guys get easily distracted? I am one of those guys who gets easily distracted. Whenever I have to study, I, I have to shut my door. Or when I'm at home, you can ask my wife, when I'm at home, it's usually when she's asleep that I have to shut, even have to shut the bedroom door so I can't hear her or, or, or snoring in, or the TV, whatever it may be. <laughs> no, I, that's right. I'm sorry. She don't snore. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just seeing if you guys are awake. That's all. My wife obviously is, and I'm going to be sleeping later on. Anyway. Yeah, I have to shut the door. I can't have any sound. I can't have anything. And I, I really have to focus. And the first thing that catches my attention, I'm off on it going, wonder what that fly's thinking right now. You know, and get back to work, Terry. Get back to studying. We get very distracted. Your enemy will do everything he can to distract you. Let me read you a scripture. This is in Nehemiah 6, verses 2, the first half of 2. It says this. Sambalat and Geshem sent me this message. Come. Let us meet together, Nehemiah, in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. Let's talk this over. First of all, first spiritual law. Whenever they call you to the land of Ono, don't go, okay? <laughs> don't go. It's not a good idea. It's not a good thing. But here's what they're saying to Nehemiah. They're trying their best to get him to stop. They realize he's coming to a conclusion here on this city. And they'll they're going to be the way they were. They're going to be strong again. We got to stop them. So they do their best to trick him to come in and say, come off the wall. Let's at least talk now. See, now they're, now they're coming across nice. Now they're coming across sweet. Now they're coming across, it's like, you know, we can, let's figure this out. Let's work this out through talk. I mean, it sounds reasonable, doesn't it? And they say, let's, let's go, let's meet in the village, let's meet in the uh, village in the plain of Ono. The enemy wants to stop the progress of Nehemiah. So they try their best to take him off the wall. When you start moving forward and doing what God's called you to do, the enemy is going to distract you and he's going to throw up all kinds of things. For instance, suppose you want to be in the word of God. You want to read the Bible. And as you're reading the Bible, 
all of a sudden you go, all right, before I, all right, before I open it, I'm just gonna get on the internet real quick. I'm gonna get on Facebook and I just wanna see what's going on real quick. And then all of a sudden you're on there for the next three and a half hours. And you, and you never got to the Bible. You never got to what God has called you to do. Or you never got that you said that you wanna do. And you've been distracted by something like that. It's very easy to get distracted. I'm one of those people. Or maybe, um, uh, but sometimes, uh, let me, I can't read my, I can't see, I can't read my own writing. I can't read my own computer's writing. Here we go. Um, you're really hammering something out. You're really studying and all of a sudden you get on the computer and you get distracted with something else. Sometimes God can, sometimes good things can distract you. You know, you know, not everything that distracts you has to be bad. It, not everything that distracts, I've been kicking these things the last couple of days. Not everything that distracts you, that thing is distracting. <laughs> Not everything that distracts you has to be bad. It could be good. You could be a, a mom that says, you know what, my goal, I have three children at home, and my goal is to pour my life into these kids. My goal is to raise them up to fear God, to know God, to know the word of God, and is to give them uh, morals and to give them values. That's important, and it's really lacking in the world today, is it not? And then when a mother wants to do that, then all of a sudden something good comes along. Hey, how about, could you join this uh, particular choir? We're going out singing these Christian songs and it has this great choir. It could be something very good. You, see, you know, that, that, that sounds good. I, I, can, I can work it in. I can make it work. Or, or I can, how about your kids? They want to join this particular sport. Nothing wrong with sports here, but I'm just saying sometimes a lot of these good things that we want for our kids, we want for our own lives, they could be distraction from the better things. They could be distraction from the best things that God has called you for that season. There are seasons that God has called us to be very focused on what he's called us to do. And lots of times we can see these other things, good things, and gravitate towards them and, and listen to them and go towards those things and be distracted from that very good thing that God wants us to be in. Amen? Like raising our children. Maybe something in the church. You know, the, church, the churches that do a little of everything, they're kind of like a very, very wide river, only about that shallow. A shallow river doesn't make a difference in the land. It's the rivers that run deep. It's the rivers that run very deep and they can be narrow. They're the things that carve the land. They're the things that make shape the land. They're the things that transform the land, amen? Sometimes God has called us in seasons of I want you to be about this, but the enemy will try to distract you with bad things and good things. You and I have to set it in our heart. What has God called me to do in this season? What has God called Faith Outreach Center to do in this season? What has God called my family to do in this very season right now? God has some good things for us, amen? And the devil wants to distract us in those things. Now remember, this all starts with, number one, we're praying, God, give me a burden. What is it that breaks your heart that you wanna see changed? And it may be something so big that you're thinking, there's no way I could do that. That's God. If you could do it easily, if you could do it on yourself and your own strength and your own skills and your own wit, you know what? It might not be difficult enough for you because God's not going to get the glory more than likely you are. Amen? We're going to find at the end here when they built that wall how the whole world around them realized this was a God thing. And they feared God. So, sometimes distraction comes in little things. And, and matter of fact, a distraction doesn't have to be big. Listen to this. It could be a whole bunch of little things. And those little things, they just keep adding up and adding up, and all of a sudden those little things become a big thing, and you're not where God has called you to be. Amen? Amen. All right. So here's how we're going to respond to that. How do you respond to distractions? How do you respond to the devil throwing up all these obstacles in your, uh, in your way? Let's see what Nehemiah does. He says, this is what he says, I am not coming down. Say that with me. I am not coming coming down. What is he doing? He's on the wall, building the wall. Here's a leader. He's right up there, elbow to elbow, working with everyone else. And all of his officials are with him, building this wall. And they're saying, let's just, let's just come down and talk, man. Let's just work this thing out. Talk to us. He says, no, nah, I'm busy. I'm doing something great for God. I'm doing a great thing, and I'm not coming down off the wall. Here's what he says in Nehemiah 6, 2b and 3. It says this. Now, remember, he says, come on, let us meet together in Ono. And by the way, but they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project. I'm in a season where God has called me to do something big. And K 
cannot and I cannot go down. Why should the work stop when I leave it and go down to you? I'm not coming down. Sometimes you and I, we got to get that in our spirit. Like I said, people ask you to do some good things. And sometimes it's hard to say no to the good things because you feel like you're putting them down. You feel like, um, you're, you're, you know, you think they're going to look at you like, oh, well, who do you think you are? You know, they may do that. Who cares? What are you doing? You're called to do something great, not mediocre. Amen. God is a great God and God wants to do great things. He doesn't want to do just mediocre things. Hallelujah. And he needs people who says, believe that he's a great God and people that are willing to do the hard things, but people who are also focused and stay on that thing right there. He says, I am not coming down. For instance, here at the church at one time, and I still think it'd be so cool to do, let's do a movie, you know? Let's hire some real actors, but let's, let's do a movie and, and, and show it to the city up here at uh, Rochester Times Theater and do a Christian movie to get people saved. You know what? That, that is a cool thing to do, is it not? But the thing is this, when you get so caught up in that, 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 the movie thing, all of a sudden there's certain things within the church that start uh, become lacking. They don't get the attention that they really need to do or the things that we've called to do, they become lacking. You know, that's a good thing. But you know what? It's not what God has called us to do, so we don't need to come down. So we have to say, I am not going to do that. We don't, we're not going to do movies here. We're not going to do a gym. Hey, let's have a gym where we all come together and we work out to Christian music or we, we're dancing to uh, Amy Grant and working out aerobics and stuff like that. You know, whatever. Do people, okay, anyway, let's do that. You know what? That, that's a great thing. Let's do that. But next thing you know, now we're going to be, everyone's part of that. And that's the big focus of everything. And all of a sudden, everything that we're supposed to be on the wall, that we're supposed to be building, the difficult thing that God has called us to do, starts lacking. And that good thing has distracted us. So what we have to say is this, I'm not coming down. You don't have to be mean about it. Just, I'm not coming down. No, no, that's not for, that's not for us right now. That's a good thing, but not for me. God's called me to a great work. I'm not coming down. Amen? Say that with me. I am not coming down. You got to get that in your spirit. Because like I said, some of us are people pleasers. I'm a people pleaser person. I, oh, I got to make you happy. I, well, some of you anyway. I got to make you happy. You know, I, I got to do this. I don't want you to be mad at me. I don't want you to think, stop that. We say, God, have you, call, have you really called me to this? Then I'm going to really put my face to it and put my feet to it. And I'm going to work it and I'm going to stay in the wall until it's accomplished. Amen? Hallelujah. All right. The second strategy that the enemy does, when you come closer to doing what God has called you to do, he's really going to fight harder and harder and harder. This is the second strategy. Your enemy will try to discredit you. He'll try to discredit you. And he'll do this in two ways. The first way is this, by spreading rumors. Spreading rumors. The more you do for God, the more the people will gossip about you. You hear that? The more that you do for God, the more the people gossip about you or the more the people judge you saying, who do you think you are to do this sort of thing? You think you're righteous? You think you're better than the rest of us? They'll come against you, but they will gossip about you and they'll, they'll say something to somebody else. Yeah, he thinks he's better or she thinks she's better than the rest of us. She thinks she's Miss Holy Holy Pants or whatever it is. You know, don't listen. You know, just stay away from her. They're just kind of crazy there. They will gossip. They will try their best to discredit you through gossip. They'll misinterpret your motives. Your motives are good, but they'll misinterpret like you're being altruistic. You're trying to just puff yourself up. Well, that was a big word, Jimmy. Did I use it right? Oh, I didn't. Okay, never mind. <laughs> anyway, don't misunderstand you. Look at Nehemiah. It says this in Nehemiah 6, verses 5 through 7. Then the fifth time, Sambalat sent his aid to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter. What is an unsealed letter? An unsealed letter was a letter that was meant for everyone to see. It wasn't private. It was meant to be like a today's blog post. Amen? You know, when you get online and you write something about somebody, you want everyone to see it. A lot of people get on Facebook. A lot of people get on these social media things just so people can see what they're doing and think how important they are. Well, sometimes people use that sort of stuff to gossip about someone, to slander someone. And that's what's happening here. And here's what it says. In which was written, it is reported among the nations and Gisham. Gisham is also a bad guy, says it's true that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you're building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you're about to become their king and have appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this is, 
Now this report will get back to the king, so come, let us meet together. Come on, Nehemiah. What you're doing here, you're trying to be king. You're trying to revolt against the real king right now. You know what? We better talk this over. And so what he's doing, he's lying. And Nehemiah sees this. He sees right through. He goes, you're lying. None of this stuff is true. And he's trying to discredit Nehemiah to everyone else. And that's why this letter is open so that everyone hear about it and read it as well. If you read Nehemiah 5, it's just the opposite. Nehemiah was not trying to become king. He was generous. As a matter of fact, when he went to do the king's business, the king says, hey, here's the gold, here's the wood, you can do all this sort of thing. And not only that, when you do the king's business, you can pull from people, you can pull a tax from the people of the land. You can have the people feed you the good food. That's what you could do, and it's perfectly illegal. Nehemiah didn't do that. He used his own money. He used his own uh, needs, needs, he used his own ways to meet the needs of the people there. Matter of fact, he fed a lot of the people out of his own pocket. So everything that these Sam Ballot was talking about was a 100% lie. And they knew that as well. Matter of fact, uh, here's what it says about Nehemiah. It's not up there on the screen, but I'll read it to you. It says this. I also devoted myself to working on the wall. Listen, this is important. Leaders, you got something that God's called you to do? You be about working too. Don't just assign people to do it. Okay? One thing I can't stand is a leader who won't work also. I, I, I work. I want to work. I want people to say it's important because, look, the pastor's doing it. Or, look, uh, he's not a lazy guy wanting everyone to serve him. I don't like that. And this is what Nehemiah is doing here. He says, I devoted myself to working on the wall. He could have been in an air conditioner trailer working out on the blueprints, you know what I'm talking about, and that everyone else do the things, making all the planning. But no, he's up there on the wall doing it as well. And I refused to acquire, to acquire any land. And I required all my servants to spend time working on the wall as well. I asked for nothing, even though I regularly fed 150 Jewish officials at my table, besides all the visitors from other lands. The provisions I paid for each day included one ox, six choice sheep, or goats, and a large number of poultry. And every 10 days, we needed a large supply of all kinds of wine. Yet, I refused to claim the governor's food allowance because the people already carried a heavy burden. Wow, that is a giving guy. He must really believe what he's doing. If he's paying up, amen? He must really believe that God has called him to do this. And he's doing all this work. And here we have someone who's trying to discredit him by spreading false truths, by lying, by rumors. And when you start doing something for God, people are going to misunderstand your motives and they're going to make rumors up about you as well. Church, don't let that phase you. We're going to see how he responded to that. We don't face opposition because we're doing something wrong. We face opposition because we're doing something right. This is how Nehemiah responded to it. This is what he said. He says, not true. Then he prayed and he got back on the wall and started working. That's what he did. This is all he said. What you're saying, that's not true. Got on his knees and prayed to God, said, Lord, I want to be in your will. You know, sometimes, sometimes those rumors will affect you emotionally. That doesn't mean you, they just bounce off of you and you're that tough. You're still human, amen? And so they'll affect you. And what you got to do is say, not true, and get back with God. God, I love you. God, I want to serve you. I want to make sure this is not right in my life. And God says, well done, get back to work. And you get back on doing what God has called you to do because you have a great work that God's called you to do. Amen? Amen. You better have a great work. That's what, God, what we're here for. We're not here just for ourselves to take up space and time. We're here to do the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. He didn't respond by writing his own blog. This is not true. This did a lie about, you know, he didn't respond by sending out open letters to everyone else. He just says, not true. Prayed and he got back to work. That's what we need to do as well. Don't let someone else take away from what you're doing. The second way that they, uh, the enemy will try to compromise you, I'm sorry, will try to uh, discredit you is through compromise, tempting you to compromise. First of all, he'll spread rumors about you. Ah, that didn't work. You know what I'm going to do next? I'm going to tempt you to do something bad. I'm going to tempt you to do something wrong. Compromise your integrity. Compromise by sinning, and that's going to discredit you. There's a new character right now I just want to read about, and I'm going to say this name, Shemiah. 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 That's it. Uh, probably Shemiah was a temple priest because we're going to read about where he tried to get Nehemiah to come into the, uh, the, the temple there. But let's, here's what happens. 
By the way, only the priest was allowed into that area. And now he's trying to get Nehemiah to sin by coming in there. He says this, one day I went to the house of Shimeiah, uh, son of this person, who was shut into, into his home. And he said, let us meet in the house of the God inside the temple. And let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. By night, they are coming to kill you. See what he's doing? Hey, Nehemiah, you, you do know you have enemies. You know what? Come on, come in here to the temple. Come on, come into the temple right here and we'll shut the doors and we'll keep you safe. We gotta keep you safe because you're important. You're the one that's leading everything here. We gotta keep you safe. You're entitled to this protection. And Nehemiah saw right through that. He goes, man, if I go in there, that's number one, that's a sin against God because God says, I'm not supposed to be in there. And number two, people are gonna see that and they're gonna see me as a coward and they're not gonna be encouraged at all. And they're gonna be afraid as well. So he didn't fall for that. According to God's law, it would have been wrong for him to go in there. Here's what he did. In verse uh, 12 and 13, it says this. Nehemiah says, I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because of Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. He'd been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this. And then they would give me a bad name to, say it with me, church, discredit me. The devil wants to discredit you. He wants to trip us up and make us sin. Listen, we all sin. We all sin. But in that very season there, I'm talking about some of these sins. For instance, we're talking about, well, it could be anything, but let me give you an example. Some pastors who are doing great works for God. And, uh, and in doing this great works for God, the, the ministry is just growing and growing and growing. The numbers of people is just growing. And the church is just growing. And great things are happening. And all of a sudden, we have this, this pastor who thinks, you know what, things are going good. And all of a sudden, here comes this temptation. It comes along like maybe something with the books, maybe something with the numbers. You know, I really need something here. Or I need this particular thing. So I deserve a higher pay. I deserve more money. And so I, I'm going to fight for that. You know, all of a sudden, they're distracted. They're off to something else, and they're sinning where God says, look, I called you to do this. I didn't call you over here to fight for your income to be higher and higher and higher. Get back to work. But they think themselves so important. The enemy has convinced them you are bigger than what you think you are. You're more important than what you think you are. So you're going to be involved in some things that you're going to be important. They're going to, people are going to look to you. And all of a sudden, this, this sense of pride will come upon you, and the devil is going to use that as a temptation to get you to sin. Amen? That's all the devil is. He's just a tempter. If he can get you to sin, he will discredit you. Look what happened uh, with politicians. I mean, people are digging up their past like crazy, and it's discrediting them. It's destroying any uh, voice that they may have with the people. And the devil wants to do that with the church. And he will trip people up. He'll trip up pastors. You know what? Your wife doesn't understand you anymore. You know, you're out here busy and she's at home and, she's, and every time you come home, you're always arguing. You're always fighting. She doesn't get you. She doesn't understand that you're doing a great work for God. But yet, someone at the office does understand what's going on, does understand what's happening, and they're sympathetic to you. And you listen to that. That's a temptation, is it not, church? And the devil's trying to bring you in and trying to destroy you and trying to discredit you right then and there. Or maybe, like I said, maybe with the money, maybe you have this particular funds or something like this and you're, you're trying to, you're the books, you change the books because you're trying to get the things that you want. You know, they'll discredit you. It happens again and again and again and again. Number one, this is the reason why we should always pray for our spiritual leaders. They're a man, they're women, and they're vulnerable to temptation and they can fail. And they need prayer. They need prayer for strength to resist temptation. And so do you and I. So do you and I. Very easy for leaders to fall for this. As you rise in leadership, your spiritual enemy will try to convince you you're more than what you really are. I deserve more money than I'm paid. Then greed sets in. Doing important things and people start noticing you. Then all of a sudden pride sets in. Sexual temptation sets in. You have a great reputation making a difference at work and, and you're doing great things. You're praying with people. But just one thing can discredit you. The closer you get to doing what God has called you to do, the harder the enemy is going to fight you. So when the enemy tries to distract you, what you're going to do, you're going to say, I'm not coming down. When the enemy tries to discredit you through uh, uh, these things, what are you going to say? You're going to say, I am not giving up. Say that with me. I'm not giving up. You may fall. 
get back up. I'm not giving up. Because a lot of people, when they come to this situation, they fail in that area, all of a sudden they just stop. I mean, some drastic sins like that, they need to be dealt with. They need to be healed. They need to be, have accountability. They, you just, I don't like it when, this is Terry Baldwin speaking, okay? I don't like it when people, uh, they, they have these certain positions and they do these things that the whole world sees and it discredits God and it destroys God's testimony and it destroys their testimony. And then all of a sudden they said, you know, people say, you know what, you need to sit down for a while. You need healing. No, I'm back on it. I'm getting back here. I'm, you know, sometimes you need to sit down, amen? You need to do the right thing. But when you sin, and, or, or when people try to get you to sin, you know, you say, I'm not doing it. I'm not getting down from this wall. And you know what? I'm not giving up. You may tempt me here. No, I'm not going there. I'm not going to think that. I'm not giving up. I'm not thinking that way. You may come over here and start doing something, and they give you another temptation. No, you know what? I'm not going there. I'm not going there. I'm not going there. Sometimes you've got to say that out loud to yourself. I don't know. If, if you're like me, I have to tell Terry Baldwin. It's like Terry Baldwin telling Terry Baldwin, get your butt back to gear. Terry, don't you dare go in this area because you know exactly what's in there waiting for you. <laughs> Amen? We do. You know exactly what's waiting for you. You know the temptation that's there, and you think that you just want to tiptoe by it and just kind of look at it. Wrong! Get away from it. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up on God. I'm not giving up what God has called me to do. I'm going to get back to work. Amen? Hallelujah. And sometimes you just got to discipline yourself that way. Uh, uh, Shimei Maya said this, they're trying to kill you. So what does Nehemiah say? He says, but I said, should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple and save his life? I will not go. I will not go. I will not go. I'm not going there. I'm not falling there. You're not trapping me there in Jesus' name. The Spirit of God will speak to you. You know what? Listen, and here's something else that's very interesting. The devil will always tempt you in those areas. Sometimes, and God is always speaking to you, okay, this is a trap. This is a trap. This is a trap. This is a trap. And you hear it, and you know it. Now listen to this. Sometimes the devil will tempt you, and God's quiet. God tests us. Did you know that? Throughout Scripture, God tests people. He's quiet. You know, what are you going to do? Are you going to respond? I, I, I want to see, I'm, you, this is your chance to grow. This is your chance to grow. Every, sing, every, every single time we're tempted is an opportunity to grow, grow, grow. And then it'll get to a point that the Lord will step back and allow you to be tested and you'll come out shining as silver. Amen? Shining as gold. Silver, I guess, is no good anymore. It's gold. Amen? Hallelujah. So, he says this, I will not go. I came to build a wall, and I'm not stopping till it's finished. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up my good name. I'm not giving up my integrity. I'm not giving up the cost. I'm not giving up. I'm accomplishing what God has called me to do. Some of you may be called to a fight for the unborn. So what can you do? Is that burden on your heart? What is it that you're going to do? Maybe you're going to do something that's bigger than yourselves. Maybe you have to speak. I can't speak. Ah, maybe that's what God's called you to do. Because God's going to shine through you. God's going to shine through you. And when you speak, it's the Holy Spirit speaking into people's lives, and they hear it as well. Hallelujah. So the last four weeks, this is what we've learned. I'm coming to a close here. Jimmy, if you can come on up. The last four weeks, what, what does God love to use? Who does God love to use? Ordinary people. Say that with me. Ordinary people. You're, we're all ordinary people. God loves to use the ordinary Oh, God can use them. They've got talent. They've got money. They've got education. They've got all this stuff going for them. God loves to use the ordinary. And when he uses the ordinary, he gets the glory. Amen? So God gives burdens so strong that people will do this. They'll sit down and they'll cry. And then they'll kneel on their, get on their knees and they'll kneel and pray. And they'll have clarity about it. And then they'll stand up and they'll go forth and do what God has called them to do. Hallelujah. He or she knows with God... All things are possible. This may be so big, but you know what? With God, all things are possible. So what do you do? You define the vision clearly. You don't make it this ambiguous thing. You just say, you know what? I'm called to rebuild the wall. I'm called to fight uh, for the unborn, and God's called me to do this through letter writing. Amen? My dad has a ministry. Uh, and this ministry, is, he writes letters all the time. He writes... Probably everyone in here has probably received a letter at some time from my dad, but he just, the Lord puts it on his heart, and he writes letters to people. And that encourages people, and people have come back to church because of some of those letters. So you never know. Don't think of something in these small as insignificant. God uses those little things. 
So we define the vision clearly. Uh, and we make plans carefully. Remember, step by step. We don't just do the whole thing. We do one step at a time, baby step, step by step by step by step. And if you ever feel discouraged when you do this, when you ever feel discouraged, what are you going to do? You're going to remember your God. Amen? Remember your God. Who is my God? Man, my God is mighty. My God is the creator. My God is the one who rescued people and delivered them. My God is the one who split the sea and walked through on dry land. My God is the one who drowned my enemy. My God is the one who rescued me out of the miry clay and, and changed my vocabulary, changed my actions, changed my thoughts, changed my desires. My God has made a difference in my life. Hallelujah. My God has made a difference in my family's life, in my church. My God is doing great things. Hallelujah. Who is my God? My God is strong. My God is mighty. My God is powerful. So if you ever become discouraged, you remember who your God is. And then you fight for the cause. You fight for your son. You fight for your daughter. You fight for your family. You fight for that thing that God has placed upon your heart. You fight, fight, fight. And you don't give up. You don't come down off the wall. You just keep doing it. And the enemy's going to do everything he can to get you to stop. And you just don't say, I'm not stopping. Hallelujah. I will not get off the wall and I will not give up. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So the end of the story, what happened? The end of the story, Nehemiah 6, 15 and 16, it says this. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in the, 52nd, in the 52 days, in 52 days. First of all, I want you to know this. 52 days, they took rubble and they built a huge wall all the way around the city. Do I have a picture of the city up there or like a cartoon drawing? Maybe I didn't put that up there. Click it. One more. Mm, never mind. Go, go back. I didn't, I thought, you know, this, I just got to give us, we come, sometimes we think of a wall as like something like around this building here. This is around a city. This is around a city. And they set the gates and they did all these things and they did it in 52 days. And here's what happens. Listen, by the way, there was no lightning from heaven that destroyed their enemies. There was no talking donkey that kept them going and says, hey, do this, do that, you know, just the miracle things. There was no prayer hankies that they used. Nothing special, nothing overly spiritual. It's just people putting their nose to the grind and being faithful to what God has called them to do. Amen? And lots of times we think, oh, that's not spiritual enough. We got to do something extra spiritual. Just do that. That is very, very spiritual. Amen? Being faithful in those things that we know to do. Hallelujah. And that's exactly what Nehemiah and all these people did. These exiles, they came back and they built the wall in 52 days. And here's what happened. And when all the enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized, what did they realize, church? They realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. You're going to do something great. And people are going to say, you're going to do what? And okay, whatever. That's that's. That's high, mighty thinking. That's good thinking, but it'll never happen. It'll never happen. You know what? You didn't get your calling from them. You got your calling from God. So don't listen to them, amen? Don't listen to the Sambalats. Don't listen to the Tomayas and all the other blah, 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 th people's names, okay? That's, that's all they are. Blah, 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 blah. Ignore them. Don't listen to them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is not calling you to take up space or to make a name for yourself. He's calling you to change the world. And that means you're going to have to do something pretty impossible. And you need the Spirit of God. Amen? Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much that um, you called us out of mediocrity. You've called us into something that's greater and bigger than ourselves. You called us to change the world. You called us to change our neighborhoods. Lord God, we have neighbors around us that don't know you. They've never seen the power of God operate in a human being before. They've never seen faithfulness uh, all the way through to what it's completed to do. They've never seen that in the lives of this world. But Lord, you've called us to be that people. You've called us to be that light. And so, Lord, I pray today, as you've given us burdens, and church, if you don't have a burden, pray for a burden. It may be just a witness to the lost. That is not something small. That is something great. Make it, make it fill your heart and that you cry for it, and you seek God, and he will give you directions. Hallelujah. Lord, give us a burden. I pray in Jesus' name. We're not to be like the rest of the world, just floating through this until we die. We have a purpose. We have a calling, and that calling is bigger than we are. 
Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. As everyone's praying and everybody's just, their heads are bowed, I just want to know, there might be some here today saying, you know what, I'm not a Christian. Um, I hear you talking about this God. I hear you talking about doing something great. You know, and my life is just, I've been living for myself and my life is reflecting it. My job is reflecting it. My home life is reflecting it. It's a world wrapped up only in myself and I'm tired of living like that. I want to be set free. God can set you free and he longs to set you free and to give you a great and mighty purpose. If that is you today and you feel the Lord just tugging on your heart, would you please raise your hand and you're going to receive Jesus and you're going to become a new creation. Hallelujah. Not one that's fixed, one that's brand new. Brand new. Hallelujah. If that's you, would you please raise your hand? God will receive you today and you'll have salvation. You will be in heaven. Can I see your, any hands today? Hallelujah. I see that hand, sir. Anybody else? Hallelujah. I want you to know, uh, you who raised your hand, number one, you're not here by accident. God loves you. Oh my goodness, God loves you. And number two, you have a purpose. That's why you have a heartbeat. That's why you have a pulse. That's why you're breathing because you've got a purpose in this life. Hallelujah. And God, number one, that purpose is to know your God. Hallelujah, to know your God and to make him known to the rest of the world. God's gonna use you because you surrendered to him. Hallelujah. So I want us all to pray this prayer. Amen. And matter of fact, just repeat after me. Jesus, my life is a mess. I need help. I need forgiveness. I need deliverance. I need a purpose once again. Please forgive me for living for myself. Please forgive me for fighting you. I surrender my life to you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you that you accept me. I want you to know right now, Jesus accepts you, not for what you're going to do, for not what you've done. He accepts you because you've accepted him. Hallelujah. You're no longer an enemy of God, so you're no longer fighting against God. You'll be fighting for God. Hallelujah. You now have peace with God. And so when we die someday and we all die, we can stand before God and we don't stand before him as an enemy or someone that needs judge for our sins. We stand before him as his friend. Hallelujah. The Bible says he calls his friend. Not only that, we stand before him as his son and as his daughter. Hallelujah. We are made whole by just the fact that we surrender our lives to Jesus and nothing more. Hallelujah. Everything else is gravy. When we live for Jesus Christ, and we do the things he called us to do, then we're just building up uh, treasures and, 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 and great storehouses for us in heaven. That's what God is doing in your life today. So I want you to know, young man, that God loves you. You are saved by not what you do, but because of what God has done for you. Hallelujah, in Jesus' name. Church, let's rejoice for the salvation that is happening today. Amen? Hallelujah! Angels do better than that. Hallelujah. Well, Heavenly Father, I just want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I, again, Lord, may we leave this place emboldened for you in Jesus' name. Lord, may we leave this place also with the joy of the Lord on our lives and on our lips and everything that we do and that people will notice. Hallelujah, Lord God. Bless your church in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, you've been blessed. Now be a blessing. God bless you. If you have made a commitment to Jesus Christ after listening to this message, or if you have any questions concerning our ministry here at Faith Outreach Center, we would like to hear from you. Please contact us through our website at www.faithoutreach.cc or you can call us at 574-223-7631. We would be happy to assist you in any way we can. On behalf of Faith Outreach Center, this is Roger Vogel saying, God bless.